Well, hey, everybody, this is Bishop Joseph Juan Walker III, and welcome to Deeper Dive Mount Zion, Nashville. This is our Bible study time, and I thank God for you being connected to us in this space. Every week we come together right here to grow in God's Word, and we thank you for tuning in to Deeper Dive. Man, I'm excited and would love to connect with you right here. Make sure you follow our ministry on social media at MT Zion Nashville. Follow me at Joseph Walker 3. Follow my wife at Dr. Steph Walker. And on this YouTube page, I want you to like, share, and subscribe. Now, download our free app, Mount Zion app, for interactive notes because I know it will be a tremendous blessing to you as you want to grow deeper in God's Word and get connected even to a small group. On the app, you can click the Christian Education uh, link right there, and it will bless you. So I'm grateful to God. Listen, I'm excited because we are so ready to start this 15-week journey. Are you? We're going to start out with our giving today, and I'm excited about what God is doing. And I'm thankful to God as you sow into this ministry. You're going to be hearing about uh, our whole journey about faith and fasting and really putting ourselves in a position to receive the best that God has for our lives. Many of you have your cards and your affirmation cards, and I want you to pray over those things. At the conclusion of uh, each Bible study, I'm going to be sharing with you some incredible points I want you to think about, pray about, and journal about, and then some prayer targets. And so today as you give, I want to make sure that you give. If you're giving your tithe, your offering, you know how to do that. Many of you that are making commitments to help us reach our goal uh, of at least $15 a week. Some of you will give $150 a week. Some of you will give who knows what. I just want you to give as the Lord has prospered you and text the word RESTORE to 78228. And there, we're going to restore this house. It is our goal to make certain that all the various projects that we have to complete, and we'll keep you up to date on what's going on every single month of what's happening. And so thank you so much. This is beyond your tithe and offering. So whatever you give in that restore, make sure every week you're doing something. If it's a one-time gift, it's weekly, whatever you do, let's reach that million-dollar goal together. And I'm excited. You know what? Who knows? We might go well over a million. I believe that's what God's going to do. So this is the first week, and I'm geeked about it, and I'm thankful to God. So let me pray, and we're going to get right into this word that I think is going to undergird uh, this journey for us. Father, I thank you. I give you glory and praise for this opportunity to grow together in your word. Uh, we thank you, Father, for speaking to us all, and we pray, God, that uh, this word will be revelation to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want today to really move into the area of this first part of this series. So it'll be four parts, but I'll be dealing with faith and finances. Uh, and the next four weeks, we'll be dealing with that. And I want to talk about really financing the kingdom. Now, I want you to know we are so excited to have you on this journey of faith uh, and restoration as we embark on this transformative 15-week journey. It is going to be awesome. It's a financial fast journey culminating on the Sunday of generosity. Uh, it's culminating uh, in December of this year, the first Sunday of December. Today, uh, really, this week marks the launch of this uh, financing uh, the Kingdom Bible Study series. It's inspired by a narrative found in 2 Chronicles 24. I talked about this Sunday. I leaned into it a little bit, verse 4 and 5, and then verse 10 and 13. So as we delve into this series, I really want us to explore the practical strategies for financing the kingdom and address some critical infrastructural upgrades, building maintenance uh, and accessibility projects and much more. So I'm going to tie all this into the teaching today and help you understand your role in helping us to remain focused on this vision as we continue to grow believers and produce achievers and reach our goals together. Now, throughout this journey, it's important to know that uh, transparency is going to be our guiding principle. We're going to be truthful about the cost involved. Uh, we're going to encourage participation from every member of our congregation. And we're going to provide resources through financial literacy courses to empower wise stewardship. So we're ready to restore this house. But remember, it isn't about just raising funds. It's about embarking on a faith journey together. We'll frame this campaign as a spiritual endeavor, illustrating the uh, phases of our past, present, 
and even the promises of our future. Through storytelling and prayer and practical action, we're going to experience transformational giving that goes beyond the transactional. So make sure you have an opportunity to journal in the book you have. You have a journal at home, I'm sure, journal. And as we go through this faith journey, I want us to go through it together. Now, 2 Chronicles 24, 4 through 5, and then verse 10 to 13. Here is the word of God. Now it happened after this that Joash set his heart on repairing the house of the Lord. Then he gathered the priests and the Levites and said to them, Go out to the cities of Judah and gather from all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year and see that you do it quickly. Verse 10 says this, Then all the leaders and all the people rejoiced brought their contributions and put them into the chest until all had given. So it was at that time when the chest was brought to the king's officials by the hand of the Levites. And when they saw that there was much money that the king's scribes and the high priest officer came and emptied the chest, took it and returned it to its place. Thus they did day by day and gathered money in abundance. Verse 12 says, The king and Joadiah gave it to those who did the work of the service of the house of the Lord, and they hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord, and also those who worked on in iron and bronze to restore the house of the Lord. So the workmen labored, and the work was completed by them. They restored the house of God to its original condition and reinforced it. Now, when you hear texts like that, it's important to understand that the book of 2 Chronicles is part of the Old Testament, which contains the history of the people of Israel and their relationship with God. And during this time of the passage that I've just read to you, Joash is the king of Judah one of the kingdoms of ancient Israel. And the temple mentioned in the passage is the central place of worship for the Israelites, where they offered sacrifices and gathered for religious ceremonies. Now, Joash becomes king at a young age and decides it's time to repair the temple of the Lord. And this temple had been neglected and it needed maintenance. So Joash, being the leader that he was, gathered the priests and the Levites who were responsible for the religious duties and instructs them to collect money from the people to fund the temple's repairs. Now, the people responded positively. I mean, to Joash's request, they, they did what was asked and they willingly contributed money for the temple's restoration. And with the funds collected, the repairs were carried out and the temple is restored to its former glory. You know, the people, when they came together, they began to worship and offer sacrifices to God in this newly restored temple, rejoicing and singing praises to God. And Jehodiah, the high priest, ensured that the temple remained a holy place and appointed gatekeepers to prevent anyone who is ceremoniously unclean from entering in. The king Joash wanted to fix up the temple, yes, which was like the church for the people of Israel. And this is important because I really want to put this in perspective for you in this time as we embark upon this journey together, the importance of financially supporting the house of God. He asked the priests, the leaders, the helpers to collect money from everyone to pay for the repairs. It came from within. The people were so happy to give money, so the repairs were done, and the temple looked beautiful all over again. Then everyone came to the temple to worship and to thank God for helping them. They sang songs. They made offerings to show their gratitude. And the priests made sure that the only people who were clean and respectful, again, could really enter in. 
Now, Joash's initiative, the verses highlight that King Joash's determination to restore the temple of the Lord was, was a primary you know, a responsibility of him as a king. It's something that he held very dear to do. And despite the neglect of the temple and the years of going neglected, the temple that suffered over many years neglect, Joash took it upon himself to prioritize the repairs. It doesn't take much to look out and know what needs to be done. The Bible says he sets his heart on honoring God through this work. You see, the community responded in such a way, but the verses depict that there was such a positive response of the leaders and the people of Judah to Joash's call for contributions, which means, yes, there is a call when people see the investment happening in such a sacred place, honoring God's house. Not only were the people in the temple giving, but the people in the community also partnered with them. And many of you are watching today, and maybe you say, well, I, I, I listen to this ministry, and I not, may not be a member of Mount Zion. You still have an opportunity to come alongside and be a part of sowing into God's kingdom. You're being blessed by what happens in this place. And so they begin to demonstrate their commitment to honoring God's dwelling place. What a powerful revelation that is. And you know, when you think about it, when you give that level of stewardship to God, that level of intentionality and generosity, it causes a new recommitment to worshiping. The restoration efforts, the people renewed their commitment to worship and sacrifice because now if giving is worship and worship is giving, then worship becomes easier at that point because now my heart is there. The Bible says where a man's heart is, his treasure is. So they followed the instructions of the law of Moses and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. But what I love here is they rejoiced and they sang. They began to praise God because they understood that this was for the glory of God. See, I want you to hear this. When the house was repaired, there was such an intentional effort to make certain that the house remained in a place and status where there was purity and honor and reverence to God's house. It's one thing to build a thing, but it's another thing to take care of it and to make sure that things are representing God. And for them, it was about making sure that purity and holiness remained in the house. So he then appointed gatekeepers to prevent anything that was unclean from coming in. It was as if though he was saying, we're doing this work and we're going to assure, watch this, that we take care of what has been entrusted unto us. I want, to think, I want you to think about this for a moment. Every gift God gives you, he's giving it to you to see where you take care of it. God gives you a house. Then every part of your house should be invested in and taken care of. You should make certain that you are a good steward because you recognize you pray for the house. God gave you the house. So you don't let your house go to ruins because it was a gift from God. Your car, you don't let your car go without oil or gas, you make sure you take care of it because everything that God gives to you, he gives it with the understanding that you're going to be a good steward of it. Well, it's the same thing with his house. God says, now I want to know, once I bless your house, will you take care of my house? Will you make certain that my house is A++++ in excellence? Will you make certain that my house has nothing lacking, that when people see the temple, they can see the glory of God, that people who worship there have made God their priority. And so they begin to show obedience, and we need to as well in our tithe and offering. Remember, this project, this 15 week journey is above your tithe. We don't want you to take your tithe and put toward a store. We want you to pay your tithe and your offering and say, you know what? This $15 or $20 or $30 or whatever I'm giving every week, Whatever number in my spirit the Lord told me to give to this campaign, I am going to make sure it's above my tithe and offerings. And Joash's call to contributions toward the temple restoration was effective because people responded. They were obedient. It was a call to revive the Mosaic law concerning tithe and offerings. And this obedience reflects a renewed commitment to God's commands and a recognition of his sovereignty. You know, Everybody was involved. One of the things that I've been praying about for this particular effort 
is that we had communal effort, that every single person, that it wasn't just a few people. You know, I talked about it Sunday. And I talked about load distribution and how if you have one person carrying all the load, it's unfair. But how if each of us hold our corner, if everybody does their part with the amount of people who show up at Mount Zion, the amount of people who say Mount Zion ministry blesses them, we might do two billion. Can you imagine that? We might, we might break a record in the world of church because we're able to show generosity at such a scale because everybody is responding. And here, the people enthusiastically responded. They didn't complain. They were happy. And it highlights the powerful moment of communal effort and obedience to God. Because when the community unites in a common religious goal, significant achievements can be made as demonstrated by this successful temple restoration. You know, they gave us so much joy. You know, the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. The people brought their contributions gladly. Nobody brought it with their lips stuck out. Nobody complained. They were excited because when you give to God, man, there was such an excitement. I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. So let each one of us give as he purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. There it is. You see, Paul teaches that, that God's love for a cheerful giver speaks to the fact that if you have been a cheerful receiver, then you got to be a cheerful giver. It meant that what I have in my hand started with God's heart. He released it to me. And when I release it back to God's kingdom, I'm excited because they have a heart of gratitude. You will never be a cheerful giver if you don't have a heart of gratitude. I'm talking to people today who can declare, Lord, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for all you've done in my life, for the ways you've made, for the food you put on my table, for helping me get my children back to school. I'm thankful for the gas in my car. I'm thankful I got options in my pantry. I'm thankful for your provision. See, God's provision happens through obedience. The narrative shows that God provides for his purposes through the obedience of his people. And as the people brought in their tithe and offerings, that was sufficient provision for temple repair. Think about this. That was more than enough. What I pray for in this 15-week journey, before we even get to the first Sunday of December, that the team looks at me and says, Bishop, we are already past the million-dollar mark, and it's just October. We might hit $2 million by December. Because, see, faithfulness, the reason why we spread this out, because it's in giving over time. Joash didn't merely initiate the temple restoration. He committed to a systematic method of collecting the funds. As the people would bring it, they would put it in the chest, put it in the chest. And this was accomplished by reinstating the Mosaic command for all Israelites to pay temple tax, which was a recurring obligation. We're bringing it every week, reminding myself. I'm, I'm texting restore to 78228. I'm making sure that I'm watching. I, I'm locked in, watching how we're doing. We have a thermometer right on that landing page. You can see how our giving is moving up and you can see your role in it making certain that we push it and push it and push it beyond. See, this is how God works. It's about structure. It's a structured approach, not only funding the initial restoration, but also making sure that there were ongoing needs. They had more than enough to take care of it. Now, now there were some key elements to Joe Ash's approach, the systematic giving and I think when you think about systematic giving, his plan involved the regular, consistent giving integrated into the religious and social structure of the people. We've done the same. A consistent way, 15 weeks focused on stewardship and giving and financial fasting. It is a system. This was not sporadic. It is not emotional. It is well organized. It is methodical. It is a methodical collection of funds. And, and you must understand the legal and moral framework here because by invoking the authority of the Mosaic law, Joash connected the act of giving to their spiritual duty and identity as God's chosen people. Ladies and gentlemen, we represent God. 
We are kingdom representatives. And this framework of giving is an act of obedience that clearly distinguishes us as people who are set apart for something great. You see, leadership understands this because there's a level of accountability that comes with that. Joash led by example, and he set up the system where accountability was clear. The Levites were initially slow to act, prompting Joash to take direct action to ensure that the command was followed. And it demonstrates his role in maintaining the consistency of the giving. You know, that's why accountability and transparency is so important. We've got you on the transparency side. We're going to be transparent at every step of this process. But it is important that you keep yourself accountable to not let this just fall by the wayside, to say they'll do it. No, we need your support. And King Joash initiative to repair the temple required significant financial contribution. Let's be very clear, y'all. It's going to take significant financial contribution to do what we're trying to do. The parking lot at Mount Zion, one section of the parking lot at OHB to repave it is about $250,000. You think about repairing the ceiling, parts of the ceiling at the OHB location. You think about the plaza. Think about your home if you had to replace the ceiling. Think about the things at your home and put that times 100 in a building like Mount Zion. But see, Joe Ash put measures in place to ensure accountability and transparency. That's the kind of ministry you're connected to. We're going to be transparent along the way and show you your dollars at work. So there was a collection system. He ordered them to put it in a chest with, and, and this is important, and to be and with a hole in it, and they placed it outside of the gate of the temple. They brought it there. And this is why we're saying by the first Sunday of December, we're hoping that that thermometer on the landing page is over a million dollars. Will you believe God for that with me? Will you truly trust God? I believe that this method, this biblical-based method, can help us all understand our stewardship unto God. And it will ensure that the process of how we do it aligns with what Joash did back in the Bible days. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be an amazing season. And when you think about how the priests and scribes regularly counted and accounted for what was brought in, we're going to make certain we take nothing for granted. We're going to have regular accounting processes. And Joash encouraged that there was continual oversight that the funds were being handled responsibly. Make no mistake about it. You are a part of a ministry of integrity. And we thank God. And Mount Zion's church is audited independently every year. We do what we say we're going to do. And I thank God that as they put this system in place, we have a system in place that aligns with transparency and accountability. Thanks be to God that people will know. You will see it in real time. You will see that treasure chest. You will see that place where we put it because you'll see that the mama to on that landing page. I am grateful to God. This is going to be a tremendous opportunity for us all. I am so excited. I believe that this is our time more than ever to really make a statement, a profound statement about our generosity in funding the kingdom, funding God's church. What we have been able to do to this point, ladies and gentlemen, has been nothing short of amazing. It has been because of your faithfulness. It's because of what you have allowed us to do. And the way Joe Ash and his team did this, they paid the funds directly to the vendors. They didn't take out loans. They did it by cash. We plan to do the same thing. We're not going to take out a LOC line of credit. We're going to pay every vendor what they are due when it's time because we are a ministry of excellence. We are debt free and we want to make certain that these funds that are collected are able to go specifically to the repairs that we have to make while at the same time preserving our reserves and at the same time allowing us to do ongoing ministry every single day. Let me tell you something. Second Chronicles 24 and 12, the king and Jordiah gave it to those who did the work of the service of the house of the Lord and they hired masons and carpenters to repair the house. They hired the right people to get the thing done. And that's exactly what our team is committed to doing. We're here being good stewards 
of what we have been entrusted to do. And I'm thankful to God that Joash did not rush over this. He provided oversight and made certain that every I was dotted and every T was crossed. When we fund the kingdom, great things begin to happen. We are looking at our ministry and thinking about all of the investments that we have made. And because of those investments, generations are benefiting now because the struggle that we had, they don't have to have. I'm thankful for you. And I want you to know this is about building trust, that transparency for us is the key. And we want to make sure that you're able to see your contributions, to see what we're doing with it, and to be able to say, I see in full transparency where my funds are going as I connect with this particular project. I'm thankful. These next 15 weeks are going to be crazy. And I am so grateful to have you connected. Let me tell you. Now, I know many of you today uh, have heard this word and you recognize there's a stewardship we have, a responsibility we have in helping to fund vision. I tell people this all the time. Here is vision and here is supervision. And whenever the vision is under supervision, you will always have provision. So be encouraged. No, we are believing God that as you are giving and sowing into this campaign, that God is going to send people to sow into yours. This has got to be the greatest season ever. Why? Because God is elevating us and taking us to higher heights, and he's doing it for you. Thank you for your investment. Now, here's the deal. You have your journal, and I want to make sure you journal these points because it's important as you are giving, as you are supporting the kingdom of God, that you make sure you journal now. Why is that important? Because it keeps you connected, right? I want you to begin to ask yourself, what are ways in which I could give more to the kingdom of God? Secondly, ask yourself, what are things that have hindered me in the past from giving to the kingdom of God? Thirdly, how do I see myself doing more than I've ever done in terms of my level of support, not only tangibly, but intangibly. Think about those thoughts. Meditate on those thoughts. And I want you to begin to pray over them. And as you pray over them, I want you to know the very desires of your heart, the very thing that God has promised he's going to do in your life, it's going to come to pass because God will never let you take care of his house and he not take care of yours. I want to pray over you. I want to thank God. Will you just lift your hands where you are now? Father, I thank you today for clear purpose. I thank you for those who are connected. And God, I give you glory today as we join in this journey that you're going to help us support the kingdom with generosity and joy. I thank you that we have received this revelation with gladness and we're going to move forward into what you've called us to do. On this first week of this 15-week journey, we give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Now, I want to tell you something. I want to give you a wonderful opportunity right now to accept Jesus Christ. This is all for us about everything, getting in alignment. I believe this year you promised the Lord every aspect of your life is going to be in alignment. Let's get it now. If you need Jesus, text SALVATION to 78228. If you want to reconnect, text SALVATION to 78228. If you want to be a part of this ministry, wherever you are around the world, text SALVATION to 78228. I thank God for you. And I thank God for your level of commitment. And I want you to stay around because I'll be in part two of this series next week. Until then, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you is our prayer.